so true. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Yes, Father. Thank you. Jesus, we thank you. Yes, Father. 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 Thank you. Come down, rain. Break forth, oh God. We want you to break forth, oh God, and we want you to rain from within and rain from without. I pray that that river that we talk about, it's not a metaphor for a river, it's a river, and it's on the inside of us, and we get our rivers together, and we can have a tsunami of the glory of God in this place. Amen. Glory. So we want to welcome everybody. You can have a seat now. <laughs> we had to introduce Jesus. You know, we're Russ and Kitty, in case you didn't know. <laughs> yeah, you're at the right meeting. Good job. Good job, brother. We have a comedian in our midst, and he's on the front row. That'll help. That'll help. So thank you for coming out tonight. We had a maximum number booked in, so we may have to fill in the blanks, but we're glad you're here because you've got an ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying, and He wants to talk tonight. He has a voice and He wants to be heard. Amen. Amen. So thank you for as far as you've come. Um, I'd like you to introduce yourself, starting in rows, uh, your name and where you came to the meeting from. So can we start here and we'll go straight across and come back to the rows. I'm Linda and I'm from Bel Air, Maryland. I'm Laurie and I'm from Bel Air, Maryland. I'm Angie from Richmond, Virginia. Virginia. Give us your last names too because Deshazer. we're going rec- to recognize them from Deshazer. the website. Yeah. Well, I'm Lauritsen and Laurie Agnes. Lauritsen, yeah. yes. <laughs> she goes, hi Kitty, I can't yeah, know you. <laughs> we have people stopping us at airports now, it's kind of fun. You're worse than Kitty, aren't you? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we are. We do not they know us but God. Okay, let's go. Steve Lapp from Ephrata, Pennsylvania. Elsie Lapp from Effort of Pennsylvania. Nancy Lapp from Effort of Pennsylvania. Jacob Lapp from Pennsylvania. David Lapp from Effort of Pennsylvania. Bernie Lapp from Pennsylvania. This is Jeremiah. Yay, Jeremiah, our youngest. No, he's not quite our youngest participant tonight. Okay, sis. Tracy Moore from Allentown, Pennsylvania. Dwayne Moore from Allentown. Praise God. Okay, that row's empty, so your turn. Michael Bowers from Allentown, Maryland. 
from Michael from Aberdeen, Maryland. Glory. Antoinette Fallon is from Aberdeen, Maryland. Awesome. Yeah, we're from Italy. Yeah, we're from Italy. Carolyn Connor, Rebecca Sanchez from Randolph, New Jersey. And Rosanna Sanchez from New Jersey. Melania Campbell. What city? New Jersey, Bali. Okay. About two hours away. Okay, gotcha. Where are the Pennsylvania That's people? <laughs> <laughs> Your mama was a miller. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Okay.
the prophetic is kind of a, a, a mixed experience because pastors are focused on green pastures, still waters, and prophets are all about plowing up, plowing under, take the fox's tails, tie them together, set them on fire, send them through the enemy's barley fields. <laughs> And hug the pastor and say, "I'll see you next go round." He gets to, he gets to manage some of that chaos that God ordains that a prophet brings. But I never really saw myself as a prophet. And Kitty and I uh, prayed a lot about that, and we just we determined this. You remember where John said, "Tell what you've seen and heard. Tell what you've seen. Those things that we've heard." touched, handled, those are the things that we're imparting to you. You realize that two ministers can give the same message. One of them is telling what he's seen and heard, the other one's speaking theory. Both of them are accurate, but the one who's speaking out of his theory, it's really a form of deception. It's Saul's armor. It has not been proven. And for both of us, the prophetic shaped us. I mean, I've, I've been prophesied over since I was in diapers. And growing up, trying to hide out in the pew, and those old prophets would call me out. I couldn't get out the door fast enough, and here they come, prophesying over our lives. And we began to organize. We actually helped another ministry launch, very similar to what we do. And we spent two, little over two years uh, running a business and pouring our lives into someone else's ministry to make them a success, to put them on the internet, to help them establish a prophetic school. The kind of meetings we're doing here, we did uh, 10. We helped them do 10 of those every month. Uh, We fielded thousands of prophetic uh, requests, and we delighted to do it. Uh, And we told the Lord we would happily fold anything we thought we were going to do in the gospel into making this ministry, Heartland Prophetic Council, making it a success. And uh, then the Lord began to just deal with us. He said, no, I, I want you to resign. And we tried three times to resign. And you know, uh, God's what God has in common with baseball. After three strikes, you know, after three strikes, God says something like this, dead or alive, you're coming with me. <laughs> And he pulled us uh, in, a, in not a non-turbulent way out of that uh, place of ministry. And it, it, uh, it fractured the relationship. Sometimes relationships get fractured when we don't obey God. Perfectly good relationships, perfectly good churches, perfectly good brotherhoods. You say, well, what went wrong there? Somebody didn't obey God. Somebody did a Jonah. <laughs> and they had to go swimming. And we had some time. We had our belly in the whale experience. But out of that time, Father's Heart Ministry was birthed. And the whole time, we were, I would make the statement and she'd roll her eyes. I'd say, I'm not a prophet. I'm an advocate for the prophetic. Let somebody else have the, the bullseye on their back. And then one day, uh, we had begun doing the daily prophetic word. We were prophesying to hundreds of people every month. We were sending out the daily prophetic word. We were holding prophetic meetings like this on a monthly (laughs) basis. We were doing prophetic small groups. We had started a prophetic school. (laughs) And uh, and I said that one one time too often. I'm not a prophet. I'm an advocate for the prophetic. And Kitty says, well, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, (laughs) guess what? And so we understand that there, Ephesians 4 tells us there, is, there are five ministries that Jesus paused when He was leading captivity captive, when He was taking uh, the, the souls that He had freed in, in uh, paradise to heaven. He paused and said, Hold on, fellas, I'll be right back. Can you imagine telling Samson? Telling Abraham? Telling all these great... Uh, men and Moses, I just hold on, I have something I have to do. And he gave gifts unto men, ministry gifts, anointings, five of them apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Now, in our culture, 
we certainly understand pastoral ministry. And it's not a strange thing to think, uh, who's your pastor? When you think of who your pastor is, there is a name, there is a face, there is a relationship. But it's interesting to me, it's kind of like with the nine gifts of the Spirit. How many here uh, are baptized in the Holy Spirit and you speak in tongues? Lift your hands up. Okay, put your hands down. How many of you can pray in tongues when you want to? You can just do it when you want to. Well, isn't it interesting that in Pentecostal tradition, we teach that we can pray in tongues when we want to, but the other gifts, we can't move in them when we want to. But yet, if you look in the Scripture, it delineates the gift of tongues right alongside the other eight gifts and doesn't make a distinction. It doesn't say the gift of tongues is separate. It has its own unique distinctives. It functions in a way that's different from all of the other gifts. It doesn't say that. It's just simply one group, one uh, item in a group of nine gifts of the Spirit. So what is true of one gift must be true of them all. How many pray in tongues more fluently now than when you were first baptized in the Holy Ghost? We were talking about that at at supper tonight. So what happened? Through reason of use, you become, my word for it, more fluent in that gift. Well, if you can pray in tongues when you want to, and God does not distinguish one gift from another in terms of its modality then if you can pray in tongues with you when you want to, you can prophesy when you want to. Come on now. You can heal at will. You can perform. There are two people here tonight. You have a gift of miracles in your life. You have Some people move in one of the nine gifts more than others. And there are two people here tonight. You have the gift of working of miracles. And let me explain something. It's not like the Holy Ghost Pentecostal magic touch. Notice that Paul told the Galatians... He that worketh miracles among you. And then he went on to say, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? But when he said that, he was referring to someone. He knew that congregation. He said, he that worketh miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or the hearing of faith? And they had he invoked that person's face when he wrote that in his epistle. They knew who that guy was. He was on their speed dial in case one of their kids got hurt at school and they knew who to call. This is the guy who's going to produce miracles. They knew who he was. There are two people here tonight, and if God will show them to me, I'll point you out, that are going to move in that kind of miracle. You will move in miracles at will. There are many of you here tonight, God wants you to know you can prophesy at will. And He wants you to prophesy at will. If you don't speak in tongues, He wants you to begin even tonight to begin to speak in tongues, to allow the Holy Spirit to give you an utterance that doesn't make sense to your natural mind. It's not supposed to because that's giving the enemy God's battle plan. The natural mind, the Bible says, is enmity against God. That's why your head don't get it. See, when you begin to speak in tongues, it says the natural mind is unfruitful because God is circumventing. Do you realize that when you pray in tongues, what your mind is to your soul, your intuition is to your spirit, and God lives in your spirit. And because God lives in your spirit, there are many things your spirit has in common with God. And one of the things is that your spirit is capable of responding to the pace that God thinks. Let me say that again. You know God thinks, He says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You know He's speaking about more than altitude. He's talking about pace. God thinks faster than you think. And that's why when uh, God asks you to do something, He prompts you to do something, you'll say, if I could just understand. But God's not going to explain Himself said, uh, why should I do that, God? He said, because I'm God, because I said so, I know more than you do, and I'm bigger than you are. So he didn't say you'll be led forth with intellect and go forth with understanding. He said you'll go out with joy and be led forth with peace, and that there's a peace that passes understanding. 
See, if you want what you've never had before, you must be willing to go where you've never been before. You must be willing to get out beyond your rationale, beyond your evaluations, beyond your judgments, and just obey God knowing that you have no clue and it'll produce. Miracles will happen and people will say, what's your secret? And, the, and you'll say, I have no clue. <laughs> because you're responding at the pace that God thinks. You understand that created things think slower than God does. And so, but God gave us a will that is capable of obeying at the pace that God speaks. And when you obey at the pace that God speaks, then you are moving through life in a, at an accelerated um, pace that the enemy being a created being cannot keep up with. Amen. Who's with me? Amen. So you're obeying God. The enemy thinks he can encapsulate you according to the resources and the pace with which he can keep you held in bondage. But you begin to respond by an act of your will to God's voice at the pace that he thinks. And the enemy thinks you're going to be here tomorrow morning. And you're way over here. And he springs the trap and he comes up empty handed. He pulls his lines and there's no, you're not there. Because all he's got, he's on a budget and you're father isn't. Amen. He doesn't think as fast as God thinks. And if you'll learn to obey Him, what will happen? Just as in the fall, there is a curse upon all things. In Christ there is a blessing upon all things but it is suppressed whenever you are living the life in Christ according to natural reasoning, then the fall and the consequences of the fall, the curse of the fall is able to impede you. But if you can learn to obey God, learn to yield to Him without Him explaining Himself because if He has to stop to explain to you, the enemy is going to be waiting to trip up that which God intended to be your blessing and then you'll wind up questioning and not knowing why God said to do something but it didn't work out. Let me give you another example. In the Bible, the very first uh, exposure we had to Satan was as a serpent. And it's very interesting that he was most likely a tree serpent, a arboreal serpent. Does anybody here who is experienced or has any training in herpetology, study of snakes? Do you know that tree snakes are the only snakes with stereoscopic vision? They see like a man sees. They have stereoscopic vision. All other snakes do not have stereoscopic vision. And what was it the serpent wanted Eve to do, wanted Adam to do? He wanted Adam and Eve to see things the way he saw them. You get to choose between these polar opposites. You shun the evil, you gravitate toward the good, and you live your life navigating between those polar opposites, and hopefully at the end of the matter you'll come up blessed. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. That is not navigating between principles of polar opposites. That's simply God says, do this, and you do it without questioning. Could you please explain it to me? Could you give me some comparative analysis? Can you give it to me in black and white? That part of our being that wants to do that is the part that Satan is capable of infecting and capable of drawing us down and impeding us and hindering us. But Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word... He said, I only do, John 5, 19. I only do what I see the Father do. I, as I hear, I judge. And that word judge is the Greek word krino. It means I make a decision. In other words, I'm not weighing it out. Well, how's that going to work out? No. As I hear, I judge. Amen. Whatever He tells me, that's what I'm going to do. And you begin to make a decision at a pace that the enemy cannot keep up with, that his environment cannot keep up with, and suddenly you break out into a state of entitlement where everything you say and do becomes as effective as if God said it or did it, that's been available to you all along, but you've been living in the mixture of the natural mind. Come on now. And God wants you to begin to live in the purity of His mind Amen. where you're walking in total ignorance. You have no idea why you're blessed. You can write a book and you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you can stand up and testify how you think God did it and you're totally wrong. 
is simply responding. Do what you see the Father do. And the prophetic, and where does, where does that information come from? And again, there's another kind of snake. There are vipers who kill by striking. And there are constrictors. And a constrictor doesn't kill you by suffocation. He kills you by stopping your heart. Go study about pythons. Constrictors kill you by squeezing you till your heart stops. Have you not read in the scriptures where he said in the last days, in the information age, remember Daniel said there's going to come a day that knowledge will be increased? In the information age, when at being analytical begins to just consume the human mentality, it says that will be a time that men's hearts will fail them for fear. What is that? That is the spirit of Python. That is the spirit in the woman possessed with the spirit of divination that followed Paul around in Acts 16. These men are the great power of God. Listen to them. And he put up with it. And her masters and the woman with divination promised Paul, He said, they said, if you uh, play your cards right, we'll open up every pulpit in this city for you. But Paul said, I quit playing cards when I got saved. And what happened? He wound up in jail. But it's that spirit. Do you realize that pythons will not attack fast moving prey? Pythons lurk in two places. They lurk where a, its prey will hesitate before entering their burrow. So it's whatever animal they're pursuing, that animal comes up to its burrow and the python's waiting. And they hesitate before they go in. And boom, how many of you have ever hesitated before you went through a door God opened? And all of a sudden, what looked like it was just going to be blessed, you got torpedoed and none of it worked out like you thought God told you. Another place that pythons lurk is at a fork in a trail in the, where their prey frequent and where that animal will pause there. And when they pause, the python strikes because the python will protect itself. It will, it will not attack fast-moving prey for fear of being injured. Well, let me explain something to you. That's how the enemy works. And when you obey at the pace that God thinks, then you're not the one hesitating. Satan is the one hesitating. I don't want to know if I want to get involved in that or not. I got involved in something that looked like that at the cross and I got in big trouble and it didn't work out. I think I'll leave him alone. And then all of a sudden you come out from under the atmosphere and the environment where Satan rules, the atmosphere of the mind, the atmosphere of the deliberation of the natural mind, where you're just simply obeying God without question, and all of a sudden even your mistakes, even your most blatant, egregious, ignorant, stupid mistakes are suddenly turning out to your blessing. Why? Because all of that that tends to the fall has been left behind and you've stepped out into the entitlement that was bought by the blood of Christ. And then everything you say and do begins to be as effective as if God said it or did it. Whether it's sitting down paying your bills, whether it's going to work in the morning, starting a business, closing a business, whatever it is that God tells you to do, you're going to begin to walk in a level of blessing that Jesus set the parameters for when He said, greater works than these we're waiting for God to bring something online that we think He hasn't made available yet but the question is not waiting upon God to bring something online but waiting for us to step up into the environment where He operates and begin to obey Him at the pace that He thinks and all of a sudden the enemy is no longer capable of keeping up with you He sets His ambush and you're long gone and He comes up with nothing but empty air God wants you to get that tonight. He wants you to understand that tonight because there's that demon that says it's not working. And God says you're not listening. He wants us to listen to His voice and respond to Him. And the prophet is here. The prophet is not here to hear from God for you. A prophet in a static relationship, if a prophet has a static relationship with you and He's always there to help you hear from God. That's like seeing uh, you're grown up and your mama's still chewing your food 
and putting it on your plate so you can eat it without chewing it. You understand that the prophet is there, the fivefold ministry is there for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry till you come to the full measure of the stature of Christ. Now, what ministry does the prophet train you in? What does he perfect you in? He helps perfect you in hearing the voice of God. The apostle, he helps you do other things. The pastor helps you do other things. But the prophet is there to help define, refine, and activate the voice of God on the inside of you. I'll tell you a story. As a pastor, for five years, I trained my congregation how to hear the voice of God. I did one thing that called, that got me called uh, a blasphemer more than anything else as a pastor. I needed to make room in the service to help the people hear from God, so I did away with taking the offering, and we just put a box at the back. That got me more heat from the pastors in my community. That's the one thing that got me. I heard the term, you're an apostate, for doing that. They just had a problem with that. But what I was doing was making room for the people to get up. And I taught them, you have to hear from God. God wants you to hear from Him. And I'm going to make room for you throughout the week. You come in here on Sunday. I want to hear what God's telling you. And so we entered into this period where we had a nationally known prophet household name who was coming to our little bitty church and for about six weeks prior to that in our little sharing time we called it the first corinthians 14 26 time one if you have a psalm a hymn a doctrine let all things be done and edifying and uh, they'll say oh it's got to be done decently in order no he said let all things be done if all things are are not being done then it's indecent and it's out of order i don't care how organized it is And the people began to share something that I never shared on. They began to share about how the church was supposed to have the spirit of a midwife. And and it was good, and I just was not something that originated with me. They were not echoing something I had taught. And uh, this happened week after week after week. They, you ever hear the pastor where he keeps teaching on the same thing and everybody kind of rolls their eyes and are you ever going to teach on something else? And the pastor quips, well, whenever you accept this message, then we'll go to the next one. <laughs> Sometimes God puts the preacher on like, he puts him on a loop and he's preaching the same thing over and over and over again. And that's what this was like. And they were doing in their sharing time what they always got frustrated whenever I would do it. Just bringing the same thing. It was a... Tongues and interpretation, a prophecy, a revelation, a dream, always on the spirit of a midwife. Every And it got to be a joke. They would chuckle because they tried to get past it. And there'd be like, you know, half of them had suppressed that, that way of looking at things. And then somebody else back in the back that had never said anything, God would tell them something about the spirit of a midwife. So here comes this nationally known prophet, household name, to our little bitty church with no insulation, metal walls, concrete floors. And he's coming in his $1,000 silk suit, Brooks Brothers suit, going to come condescend men of low estate and just bless this little church because he had been doing a meeting in a larger church nearby. He comes in and he did the one thing I used to have trouble with prophets. I want you to know that while you're here, you're my pastor. I submit to you whatever you say goes. I always wanted to test that theory. I had one prophet tell me that and I said, okay, come here. I said, you can prophesy to that section, that section, and that section. But all the others, you leave them alone. I don't care if Jesus appears to you personally. You don't prophesy over them. Do you hear me? (laughs) boy looked at me. And I was just messing with him. But I meant it. Don't you come here tell me how submitted you are. But this prophet, he did the same thing. I want you to know while I'm here, you're my pastor. I'm submitted to you. Anything you say goes. He said, I would like to introduce your people to the prophetic. But I also have this other little thing that I felt like God gave me. And I'm just going to give you the option. I said, well, give the other little thing. Our people have been exposed to prophetic ministry. They have some experience. Give the other thing. He got mad. I saw it come over his face. He's like me. I can't hide my feelings. Man, I can never play poker. You can just read me like a book. And I saw him get aggravated and get offended. And I just ignored it. Then when he got up to speak, 
He said, well, I wanted to introduce you to the prophetic, but your pastor said that to share this other little thing that I... And he threw you under the bus. Boy, yeah, he threw me under the bus. Boy, I got mad. And uh, he opens his mouth. He says, I want to talk to you about the spirit of a midwife. <laughs> that place erupted. They were, they were on the floor. They were rolling on the floor, laughing, holding their bellies, pounding their fists into the floor like he had told the funniest joke that you had ever heard in your life. And when, it, when the roar died down, he said, somebody want to let me in on the joke? I had him. I said, brother, just give what you've got. I'll explain it to you later. And I did explain it to him later, but I don't think he ever got it. <laughs> but as he began to share what God gave him about that the Lord changed the subject and he's talking to me about something else he said this guy's not used to being around a people who know the voice of God he was shocked that was not a response he was used to he said the prophet who comes yeah the Lord said that a prophet who comes and does not activate the voice of God in the people has done that people a grave disservice. Because, Colossians 1.27, Christ in you is your hope of glory. Amen. Christ in me is not your hope of glory. 1 John, the last verse of 1 John, he's talking to the, uh, a, a fine church, a wonderful group of believers, John was in the book of 1 John. I mean, you'd, you'd give your right arm as a pastor to, ha to pastor those people. But the very last thing, he says, little children, keep yourself from idols. And I'm like, God, I know that congregation was not going to a pagan temple. What are you saying? He said, idolatry proposes the dwelling place of God to be somewhere other than the human heart. Idolatry proposes, fosters outward dependence upon who God is in someone else rather than inward dependence on who He is on the inside of you. Amen. See, Paul said, this is the gospel I've been in jeopardy for every hour. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Philippians 4.19 says, I will meet all of your needs out of my riches in glory. And where's the glory? The glory is in you. Amen. The glory, every answer to every prayer you will ever pray is in you, in embryo. And when you learn how to speak into that glory, you will conceive, you will bring to the birth, and you will see things you've been asking God for be brought about, but you've been triangulating upon someone else's walk with God, some past move of God, some t uh, uh, trepidatious concept of a move of God yet to come. But he says, can you take now for an answer? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Glory. Christ in you, folks. If you go away and forget Russ and Kitty, but if you go away with Christ in you enlarged, then a true gospel transaction has taken place here tonight. The Lord put it to me like this. He said, Christ in you is your father. Christ in everybody else is just your brother. Christ in you is your Father. You always obey your Father. You always check with your Father before you obey your brother. Come on now. What if I make a mistake? God will make your mistakes to prosper. Some mistakes need to happen or you'll never get corrected because the mistakes you make that you know you made and you feel the sting of afterwards are mistakes that you are going to be correctable on. God will correct you. We live in a day it's so difficult to establish accountability relationships because everything about the church is on a volunteer basis. And if and that volunteerism can get pushed to its limit, and then they just check out. The one thing you can't check out of is who God is in your life because He will follow you home. Amen. He will talk to you when you're sleeping. Amen. He will meet you when you open the door. And He will talk to you in unimpeachable, undeniable ways. And the prophet 
who's the prophet in your life? Until that is an instant answer in every heart of every believer who claims to live on the cutting edge of what God is doing, then the prophet is... Do you realize that at no time since 10 years before the Revolutionary War has the prophetic had been so low on the scope of human attention. You can examine all of the writings that we have records of from the revolution, 10 years before the Revolutionary War until now, and you will find that references to the prophetic have not been at the current levels they're at now since 10 years before the Revolutionary War. Now, what are the consequences? How do we measure the consequences of that? I don't know about you, but it seems apparent to me that the economies of the earth are not only strained to their breaking point, the currencies themselves that, that structure our economies are being pushed to the point of collapse. Let the scripture interpret the problem. If we believe the prophets, so shall you prosper. What's the answer? Another Republican president? When is the church going to stop prostituting itself to the political process and go back to its knees like it did after the Great Depression? Come on now. Amen. When the 40s heal, uh, latter rain revival came, when the healing revivals of the 1950s came, when the charismatic move came, all of it paid for by a praying people who were standing in bread lines between prayer meetings because they knew they had to get a hold of God. Amen. The day is coming that God's not going to take no for an answer. He wants us to come to the place that we're going, I have to hear from God no matter what. He wants to make Himself known to us. And so I ask you again, we all need to be trained until we have the unimpeachable Word from God. And not only that, He says you may all prophesy. It's like one uh, William Branham, as his ministry began to decline, somebody came up to him, like this lady right here, and said, I have a word for you, Brother Branham. He said, what? Wouldst thou prophesy to the prophet? He was dead less than a year later. And I have utter respect for William Branham. I understand there's a cult that's cropped up around his name and I'm not answering to them. He didn't accept what they did and who they were. So what you need to know when you run into the, the cult that's around his name, if you understand his teachings, you'll know that he didn't accept what they did with him and what they did with his name. But at the same time, because he began to see himself as separate from the people. He lost, he lost sight of what he was called to do. To activate the voice of God. This is very important because why? How many want to see signs, miracles, and wonders come into the earth again? Yes, please. So how are we going to get there? Are we waiting for some nebulous, sovereign action on God's part before it happens? Do we have a record of what God does in order to bring these things about? When we look at John the Baptist... The scripture plainly says John did no miracle but he was a prophet. But Jesus didn't do any miracles until John the Baptist got a hold of him and baptized him. And John the Baptist did not say his purpose was to preach a repentance message. When he was asked about his calling, he said, the only reason I am come baptizing is because the one that called me said I would baptize the Messiah. I would baptize the one that would move in unimpeachable signs, miracles, and wonders. And that person was Jesus. So John that did no miracles activated Jesus in his miracle ministry. So when we don't have, if you want to see an echo, look, if you want to read the epistle that's being written in the earth, we see the prophetic is beginning to be more and more emphasized. We see a plethora of false prophets and they're only an echo of the fact that there are genuine prophets. God brings the prophetic online in the earth when He intends to use it to activate a ministry of signs, miracles, and wonders. But even John the Baptist had a problem with decreasing. He said that I must decrease that he might increase. 
And then shortly thereafter, he challenges. He says, are you he that should come? Are we looking for another? Because he came saying, God's going to burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He's going to destroy the wicked with the breath of his nostrils. And Jesus showed up. He knew Jesus was the one. And he sees Jesus drinking wine, kissing babies. And John was scandalized. Are you he that should come? Or That's not how it's supposed to be done. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And what happens? John had to lose his head in order to get out of the way to let God. See, it's first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. When the prophetic comes to its crest in the earth, immediately you're going to see a manifestation of apostolic power. And I'm not talking about these baby apostles out there moving in marginal apostolic ministry demanding full apostolic obedience. That is is a indication of what the scripture Jesus said, you have tried those that say they are apostles and are not and found them liars. Because they're baby apostles, they're vestigial apostles, they're marginal apostles and they're not walking in the robust, unimpeachable Uh, power or potential of apostolic calling but yet they're absolutely demanding that you acknowledge their apostleship we need to be patient with them we need to be patient with them but we cannot give them if we give them apostolic deference before they establish apostolic testimony their destiny will become an abortion and ours with it we need to think about that Because we're going to hear more and more and more about the apostolic in the earth. And one of the big problems will be is prophets getting out of the way when the apostles come on the scene because they're used to being... The the prophetic has come about in a time when the church is seeker-sensitive. The people see themselves as consumers of the ministry. Church is done as church as performance and it's evaluated and it's and it's graduated and it's looked at as though we're here to like going to a Branson show, going to a theater. And we have to and ministers feel pressured to perform rather than to simply do their job and allow God to to use them as he sees fit. Pray for the prophets. Who's the prophet in your life? When you can answer that question get ready to meet an apostle, you can lay your money down at his feet and enter into a place where even even money, even money, filthy lucre, will begin to move by the Spirit when you find someone with a pure apostolic anointing to begin to uh, connect with. Someone who will establish the DNA of God. Paul said you have many teachers but you don't have many th- fathers. An apostle is someone who will establish the DNA of God of God in your life. He will cause you to know who your Papa is. That Christ in you is your Papa. Thank you, Father. You should get up and talk for just a minute. <laughs> so, I want to share something that happened to me recently. And um, it's about... God told me to teach on um, breakthrough, that people are waiting and waiting, waiting for a breakthrough, and He told me last week, tell the people, breakthrough has come. Praise the Lord. The time, the appointed time, the set time has come. It's now. You don't have to wait any longer. Jesus already went to the cross. He already delivered the goods. And he said the time, you know, there's things that come to season. And it was a season of waiting for a long time, but the breakthrough has come. And I was reading a definition about how you advance like in a military task and you take over. You don't just take the the land. You uh, possess everything beyond it. You go beyond. And that's the time that we've known for years that we were going to move into the transfer of the wealth into the earth. Well, God's a good manager, and He's waited for this generation that He could trust before He transferred it, because He's a good manager. And praise God, yeah, you should rejoice in that, because I don't know about you, but we've done without a lot for a long time. And so he had, uh, he broke off the spirit of poverty. There was a lying vow that was taken that Christians should be poor, and it goes all the way back to the Catholic Church that we came out of, the Lutheran, and then the Baptists, and all the other denominational churches believed the lie. And God said, expose that lie. 
I'm going to break the back of it. I'm not a God of poverty, and they vowed to poverty. I'm a God of prosperity. Amen. The blessing of the Lord makes rich, and He adds no sorrow to it. So for too long, we've carried visions and dreams because God is a prophetic God. He shows you things to come. And so He's saying, go ahead and dust off your notebooks, get out a fresh notebook, start, you know, uh, I'll tell you two ways. Habakkuk 2. Uh, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets that he that reads can run with it. And I'll tell it to you like this. The Lord says, you be making a list. I'll be checking it twice. You've not been naughty, but very, very nice. The dreams and the visions that are on the inside of you are God-given. Because it, it, it looks impossible. It sounds impossible when you say it to yourself. And you almost don't want to say it to anybody else. Because I've ha- I got some in me. I'm, I'm like nine months and a half pregnant with visions <laughs> and dreams. And I know that they're at the door. They're here now. So he said, just tell the people that they have broken through. And, and I saw, I, I struggled for, I'll tell you, just to honestly, if you know us, you know we're just down to earth, honest to goodness people, like everybody else. And we have had the same struggles. Well, for years I struggled with a weight problem because I, I wanted to eat what I wanted to eat. And I hear all this wonderful information about, you know, um, Trader Joe's health food and Mama Jean's health food and all these organic things, and it just did not appeal to me, thank you. I like Krispy Kreme donuts and mashed taters and gravy. So my taste buds were just groomed like that. So so for years then I struggled, and I knew I had a whole lot of stuff we were going to do because our dreams and visions are international like some of yours. They're global. And you got to have a pretty good physical fitness to go do them. So I cried out to God and 30 years ago, I am ashamed to say, 30 years ago, he gave me I, I just asked the question um, what's my perfect weight? What did you see? Because you, his word says he likes uh, fair weights and balances. Remember that scripture? He likes good weights and measures. And he told me it was 130 pounds. Well, I tell everybody, I was born at 150 pounds. <laughs> but a couple months back, I weighed 230 pounds. And so I said, God, I really need your help. And he said, I could use some cooperation myself. <laughs> He said, give me some cooperation and I'll give you some help. I went, oh my gosh, it's back in my court. The ball is back in my court. But I knew that uh, knowing some stuff was one thing, but then doing was another. So I asked for the grace to do what he had told me these 30 years ago. So I was just seeking first the kingdom, right? And then everything you need is added. And he knew that needed to be added to my life. Some kind of something to help me jump the hurdle. So I'm sitting, our house is a small three-bedroom, and it's his, Russ's office, my office, in the middle we have a bed in our bedroom. And it's just overwhelmed with office stuff, and the ministry of that we're grateful. But uh, So I'm in my office, and I hear, I hear the sound in my heart. I hear the Holy Spirit say, a lap band operation. Uh, well, what happened if you ate like you had a lap band operation, which costs about $15,000, and I don't, don't need one, don't want one. Um, and I said, hey, Russ, well, how do people eat? Because I had an idea from heaven dropped into my heart. All of a sudden, I said, hey, Russ, how do people eat that had a lap band surgery? He goes, I'll Google it. So he can type 200 words a minute. He Googled it. He told me what they ate. The certain portion about the total meal at a time is less than a cup of food. And so the Holy Spirit said to me, Kitty, just tell yourself you had a lap band surgery. I said, what a brilliant idea. Oh, my gosh. He said, well, don't you tell yourself I'm not going to do meth. I'm not going to go rob a bank. You know, you can talk to yourself. It's just flesh. You know, just flesh. You pinch it, it hurts. It's just flesh. But my life is more about the spirit. So I had to get something in alignment. So the Lord said, just tell your body, you've had a lap band surgery. So I just looked myself in the mirror and I said, flesh, you have to lose 100 pounds. So you have had a pretend lap band surgery. You're going to start eating like you had a lap band surgery. And on top of that, you'll save $15,000, which I've already told Russ how I'd like to spend it when I get down to my goal. <laughs> So 
I, I happen to be set up and scheduled for a new hip because I've been running since I was one year old. I'm 62 this year. And I've been running ever since. I mean, I've been on the go for Jesus. And so I wore out this hip and they said I had to have a new one put in there. So here I am in the hospital and a prophet had told me, in 37 days you're going to have a visitation from the Father. I said, hallelujah, maybe I won't have to have that surgery. But the surgery day came on a Wednesday, and those 37 days weren't going to be up until Friday. And I said, it's okay. I don't hold anything against God, and I don't have to understand the full prophetic word, but I do believe the prophets. I live with one. They, you prosper when you believe your prophet. So uh, I'm in the hospital. It's the, the day I'm supposed to go home. And I've been kind of quiet in the ministry. Those of you that know our ministry, you mostly hear whose voice? Russ's. Prophet Russ. So... I'm in the hospital. I remember it's about time to go home. Russ is coming to the hospital. My girlfriend who helped to stay with me and care for me with the, the doctors was in my room, but she had to go to work at 9 a.m., and it's going on 10 o'clock, and I'm waiting for Russ to come from home with the car. And I said, oh, Father, I, I didn't move my mouth. I spoke. I just prayed this prayer inside. I said, oh, today's my 37th day, and you... You were going to touch me. The prophet said, you were going to touch me, and I was going to know that I was touched. And uh, so instantly, as soon as I had that thought, I'm in this private room by myself. Instantly, I saw the father come around the top of my bed and sat on the right side of my bed, on this right side where I just had surgery, and sat down. And I'd never seen the father, and I was, I thought you couldn't see the father, but I learned a little bit about that in the word. You know, Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I had never seen a picture of the Father in my heart or in the Spirit, but I saw Him, and He sat right there on the right side of my bed. And if I were to say to you, um, He reminded me of Father, Father Winter, what do they call Him? Old Man Winter, a big white, full head of white, white hair, and it came all the way down here. His beard was that full, and he had these sparkling blue eyes, and I have my eyes wide open, and I see him, and he sat, and I mean, the fire of God fell on me, and right instantly after I saw him, Jesus walked around this side of my bed and sat on that side of my bed. I'm telling you, we have broken through. He's coming to your house. He's coming to visit you. He is not afraid to be called your father. He is not afraid to be called your brother. He is not afraid to show himself. And then I said, I see you, Jesus. And I said, Holy Spirit, I feel you. I feel you. And thank you for coming and touching me. I didn't even know all that I had. But I got up from that bed when I went to get in the wheelchair. I mean, to go out the door, this nurse comes in that I've never seen. And she said, I'll bet you're eager to go home today, Miss Kitty. And I said, I am. I'm so excited. The ministry is exploding. And I've got work to do, got chores to do, and places to go. And she said, tell me about your ministry. And as I just told her a couple things, she starts crying. And she goes, I'm a Baptist, but I just know there's more. There's more. Isn't there, Kitty? Isn't it, isn't it about the Holy Spirit? And I go, yes. And I open my mouth, and I preach to her for 20 minutes like a machine gun. I mean, in perfect English. And she understood. And she cried, and she laughed, and she cried. And I was, I was so invigorated. And I knew that he had touched me. Because I just had a major surgery in my body, sliced open about six inches. But he touched me. And I go home, and in the last nine weeks, I have just automatically, supernaturally dropped 40 pounds. Wow. Yeah. Glory to God. So if he said it, he will do it. If he spoke it, he will bring it to pass. I want you to stir up your dreams and stir up your visions. You, you had dreams in your heart that you almost think it's impossible. It's like a fairy tale. But the Father said, it's not a fairy tale. I dropped those dreams in you. I put them in your DNA before you were ever formed in your mother's womb. I did that in the eternities. And now is the time for you to dust off your notebook, get out your pen and paper, as though you had millions of dollars in the bank, because you do. Because Father, he said, I'm going to send it where I can trust the people. Your trusted ones are, I wouldn't be telling you this message. God said, I trust you. You've trusted me to get you to a heaven you've never seen. You've trusted in Jesus who you've never been officially introduced to in the natural. And he said, I want you to trust me. I trust you with my resources. And if you can believe, because without faith it's impossible, what is? Everything. 
Stir up your faith for the dreams, for the visions. Some of you want to build shelters. Some of you want to feed the homeless people. Some of you want to open clinics and have people adopt babies instead of letting them be aborted. There are so many things that God wants to do. So just know this. It's not just a good idea. It's a God idea. And He's telling you today is breakthrough day. And if you can believe it, you can receive it. And don't doubt I, at a time, I, I had faith for this bigger restaurant and because he gave me a little one, and I had a faith for a larger restaurant. But he said, Kitty, 99% doesn't cut it. you got to believe me 100%. And so I just made that little adjustment like you do on your radio dial to get a better sound, a clearer sound. And I adjusted my faith that day. And, I mean, within 15 minutes, he came and manifested himself in my restaurant. And I'm carrying about in me a chain of restaurants that's a marketplace ministry and they will be run by uh, apostles and prophets and healers and people who can lay hands on the people and pray and chefs who will prepare recipes and cook in the restaurants that are anointed and they're going to pray in tongues while they cook the food and the people sitting there will weep and they'll cry just sitting there eating a cheeseburger because God's in the house. If you can believe it, you can have it. So he says just stir it up, stir it up, stir it up and don't doubt just say, God, I, I believe. Help and cast off it of me any unbelief in yes. the name of Jesus. Because you're caring about his dreams and visions. If we had the time, we would talk to each one of you. and you, We'd know what it was because you, you'd burp it up. You tell us what it was. You can't help it because God put it in you. It's in your spiritual DNA from heaven. So only believe and you'll receive and you'll see the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Okay, I got my instructions. So in, anyone in this room, like myself, that wants to believe for a supernatural weight loss, would you stand to your feet? Yes. Glory to God. It's His plan. It's His plan. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's five pounds, but mine was 100. Now it's only 60. Glory to God. You can have it. 100 pounds, whatever it is. Do I hear 200? No. <laughs> I'm telling you, God is in the miracle working business and we have broken through and tonight in your hearing. So um, those of you that you're standing, that you want to have some weight loss. Anybody else believing for a breakthrough and you're ready for it now? You have faith for your breakthrough. Whatever it is that you need. If it's a, a spouse, if it's money for a certain project, if it's the project, if it's anything that you've been holding out, believing, waiting for your breakthrough, tonight's the night. Tonight is your night. Let's raise our hands to heaven. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you're a miracle working God and it was not hard for you to roll back the Red Sea and it was not hard for you to fling the stars into space and you rained down manna from heaven and fed the people and then when they needed meat, Lord God, you brought meat. There isn't anything too hard for you. You said the blessing of the Lord will make you rich and add no sorrow. We want to be slimmer and fatter in our spirit in the name of Jesus. So I command a supernatural weight loss to fall on these people and the way to fall off in the name of Jesus Father you said nothing shall be impossible to those that believe that nothing shall be impossible so you have found here Father a room of believing believers and now beyond that we push past that to all the dreams in this room and some of you are the same people all the dreams and visions that God has dropped in your heart the Father said you have not believed a lie you have not believed a fairy tale this is your life this is what I planned from before the foundation of the world and I command the blessing of the Lord to come upon you and to overtake you. And I break off every foul spirit and vow of poverty that has come down through your lineage, through your generations in the name of Jesus. And I command the blessing of the Lord that makes rich, that adds no sorrow to it, to come upon you, to overtake you. And now you go home and you make that list. He'll be checking it twice. That talks to me of double portion. You've not been naughty. You've been very, very nice. He said, the dreams and the visions that I've given you, I am ready to bring to pass. But I'm looking for somebody who can put it down, write it on paper. Some of you will be the one that runs with that vision, and others will share it with another person and another group of people, and they will do the work, and you will just supervise it because God trusts you. And he said, if you can believe, you can receive tonight. So, Father, we are believing believers. We believe. We receive it in the name of Jesus, and you're going to manifest it and we're going to hear testimony after testimony of the goodness of God in the land of the living in Jesus name.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. You can be seated. Oh, hi. Hi. Let me do this now. Okay, so when we left home, we forgot our offering basket. It's in one of the closets of the house in Branson, Missouri. So my sister Kathy in Cory, Pennsylvania, made these, put Father's Heart Ministry. If you um, want to write a check, it's offering time. And this is how we make our living, because we're full-time in the ministry, and we receive offerings in order to keep going around the world. And so um, if you're making out a check, make it to Father's Heart Ministry. Uh, the books are up here, and the CDs are Russ's, so you can make checks payable to Russ if you want to write a check for any of these. And he may, you may have time to talk about them. If not, yeah, if not, you guys look over the material. You'll know it's good. If you know Russ, you'll know it's good. So um, would you want to help me with this one, Alex? Yes. And then maybe one other brother. How about Joe Yushinsky? <laughs> Joe and Angie and Kayla came in late. They were here the last time we came to Lancaster, and then they took us to their home and fed us like royalty. <laughs> yeah. So here, however you want to do it. <laughs> Glory. <laughs> Did you guys enjoy that music in the beginning we had? Yes. Just one touch. Yes. Just one touch from the Lord. We were singing that over Branson uh, a week ago. Oh, it's Godfrey Bertle. In the worshiper that we were playing earlier, Godfrey Bertle, Just One Touch, When I See the Blood, and Just One Touch, When I See the Hear the word of the Lord. Yeah, what's that? You're still God. You're still God, no matter what happens in the government, in the cities, in your families, in your towns. He's still God. But when we were playing that... Um, the album that all three of those are on, it's called, we don't sell these, it's Very God. Very God. God if you want to look God. it up, if you want to Google it, yeah. Godfrey Bertel. And he's on YouTube, he has his own channel, and all of that music is out there. Amen. So we were playing that one over and over in our last meeting last week. Thank you, Joe. And... Um, we finished that song, and the people would not stop worshiping, You're Still God. Yeah. It, they wouldn't stop worshiping. And the music was done, and they wouldn't stop worshiping. <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then we looked at each other, and we just broke out in more worship. And then it got louder, and it got stronger. Pretty soon they were on their knees, and we were just worshiping, and God came in the house. He oh, wants yeah. us to believe that yeah. He's still God, no matter what's going on. We do not believe that the sky is falling. We believe that the kingdom of God is coming in the earth. And you're a big part of that. Every one of you within the sound of my voice, you're a part of bringing the kingdom of God into your home, into your family, into your neighborhoods. Don't be shy. Just tell them the truth. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the offering. We thank you that we're able to go around the globe and preach your gospel. We thank you for the goodness of God. And we pray a blessing upon each person that was able to give and those who have a heart to give. We ask that you would put finances into their hands so that they can give every single time they want to give into an offering and be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want to give some prophecies. Now, we have a, when we rent this room, we've used it before, we have to be out of this room by 10 o'clock. And so that would preclude, and as a matter of fact, to properly prophesy to every one of you, we'd be here until 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> but let me say something to you. I, we have, in our lifetime, Kitty and I have traveled hours and hours and hours, sat in a meeting, and no matter how mature we tried to be about it, if we didn't get a prophecy, you went home with something in your belly. You know, it's like, oh. And a pouty lip. You know, yeah, a little bob end, like we used to call that down in Louisiana. But you, that need not be where Father's Heart Ministry is concerned because we have a website, propheticnow.com or fathersheartministry.net, where if you are not, you can relax, you can breathe, 
Because if you're not prophesied to tonight, you can go home and before you go to bed, you can go to that website if you choose to and request a prophetic word. We have business cards. And it would be... Yeah, and we have business cards. You might want to pass those around if you don't have one. And uh, be sure, the one thing I would say to you, because you've uh, been so kind to come out to the meeting, I want to give you preferential treatments. So there is a place in your request to make to say something, to share something. And in that comment, if you will simply mention Lancaster, because we get almost 2,000 requests a month. I have a team of 60 people that we have trained that help us with these. And uh, we do our best to get to every single request. But I want to make sure that you don't get ignored, that you don't get overlooked that uh, you're going to hear from us, so be sure to mention, if you go to make a request, mention Lancaster. And that way I can search, and it'll come right up. And uh, we'll be able to, to, to do that. Thank you, Father. Here's the first one. Oh, this is for Alex. I will both of them. Can now we can this is for Alex and Lisa. It's not going. Red button. Now. This is for Alex and Lisa. Alex and Lisa, would you stand up, please? Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Father. Alex, this is one of those left handed prophecies. You'll understand what I mean when I give it to you. Okay. I remember when I was probably... How many know Bill Hammond of uh, Christian International? He called me out in front of a group of pastors one time. He says, that fellow there, he's like me. He's got more beach than waves. Why don't you stand up? And he, before he prophesied to me, he turned around and looked at his, crowd, his, his team that was on the platform. He said, now I've told you not to prophesy to somebody like this, but I have to give this guy what God gave me for him. He said, so you don't do what I do, you do what I say. Is that clear? He said, no, Oklahoma boy. And he turned around and gave me a powerful prophetic word. Yeah. And, uh, and this is what I'm not going to prophesy to you, but I'll tell you this part of it. One of the things he prophesied, he said, in about three years, this is not for you, this is not your word. In about three years, Bill said, I'm going to zero you out, get you level with the ground, because where I'm taking you, you're not going to be able to go with your life as it looks like now. Three years to the week, my house burned to the ground. And God catapulted me into ministry out of Louisiana into the state of Missouri where the most important thing that happened was that would be I me. met her. That would be me. <laughs> so, having said that, Alex, as I prayed for you, the Lord said, you're a shoebox apostle. God says you are a shoebox apostle. William Seymour, if you will go read about William Seymour. He was a carrier of the glory. He was a carrier of an anointing. He tried to be a pastor and he died of a broken heart. But while he understood that he was a carrier of the anointing in the Azusa Street Revival, he would, get on, uh, he would go to that meeting he would kneel down between two shipping crates and put his face in a shoebox. And he would just pray in the Holy Ghost. And God would show up. And they had nonstop outpouring of the Spirit of God for three years straight. And the Lord says, You are a carrier of the glory. You will superintend. You will facilitate. You will make room for an outpouring of the Spirit, much of which you will look and see what others are experiencing. I see you at times praying in meetings that you are a part of leading, and I see you looking up and everybody's laid out in the Spirit, they're in the glory, their faces are shining like angels. And you know, you're like, okay, God, what's wrong with me? Am I cream cheese? You know, bagels and cream cheese, what's going on? Any messianic believers here? Oh. Uh, 
and but God says you are a carrier of the glory. God says you are a shoebox apostle. You are one who's a facilitator. You have a sense of security in you. You can handle criticism. You can handle criticism and not get bitter. You can handle uh, being maligned, being accused, being falsely uh, said that you're doing this and so. They'll put your name on things that are done in your presence that you had nothing to do with. Because the Father says, I'm putting within you an innate understanding that you must not pull up the wheat with the tares. Mm. And I'm going to use you, says the Father. I'm going to plug you in to a move of the Spirit that I'm pouring out upon this part of the nation. And you're going to make it possible. You're going to move in latitude and indulgence and in permissiveness to allow the children to play. To allow, suffer the little children to come unto me. It doesn't matter if their doctrine is all correct. It doesn't matter if they're practice is, is doctrinally and theologically accurate. You're going to accommodate the children and the Father says I'm going to I'm going to swoop in and scoop them up and raise up a mighty army of warriors in the earth, says the Father that will look and they're going to have your spiritual DNA in their lives, says the Lord. Glory to God. Because you have an affectation and a humility and a pragmatism about you that you understand a little foolishness will not abrogate the wisdom of God and will not hinder that thing that God is proposing to do. And there will even be times that you're going to be sought out to come say, would you just come and just facilitate this meeting? We have people that are coming together and the people that are trying to lead it quit because they can't handle that. Can't handle the manifestations. Can't handle the mixture. Can't handle the way they're dressed. Can't handle what they're pierced with. Can't handle their tattoos. They just can't take it. They've tried to be loving and kind, but their religious background, they can't take it. And you're going to get a phone call say, would you just come and just sit in on this meeting and you'll go and, and literally you'll walk in and the glory will walk in with you. Hallelujah. And they will feel the permissiveness of heaven upon them. And Jesus is going to show up and He's going to sweep those little children. Immature, filling their diapers, <laughs> making a mess. They have to be cleaned up after. And God says, through you, I'm going to channel the love of a father for little spiritual children. Thank you, Lord. And he says, that's only the beginning of the thing that I'm going to do in your life. And Lisa, the Lord says, I'm doing a deep thing in your heart. I see the Lord. He says, I'm going to plumb unimaginable depths. Previously, it almost like God, I didn't know there was that much deep on the inside of me. And I saw him just kind of reach down, way down deep in your heart. And he even, it's like he closed a, um, like a breach, like a big zipper. He just zipped something up. And suddenly you just manifested uh, as a mentor of young women. Thank you. He said, your daughters have a special blessing according to them because they've not only been your daughters mm, thank you, Lord. they've actually been uh, <laughs> like crash dummies you know like like uh, <laughs> you know it's like I tell my I tell my oldest son he said how come I get the birthright I said because I make all my mistakes with you that's why why does the oldest get the birthright because he needs the birthright in order to break even for all the things we learn about learning to be a parent and God says your daughters have a very special blessing according to them of course there's not a parent alive who doesn't feel like they're a very good parent but God says part of your parenting it's like I, I see you it's like is all that necessary was well, that necessary God and the Lord says uh, I'm going to take what you've learned with your daughters and I'm going to marry a parenting skill that I value. Now listen to what the Lord's saying. I'm going to marry a parenting skill that I value with an anointing that I'm releasing upon you and you're going to begin to mentor young women who are orphaned, 
They are fatherless. They are motherless. They are without spiritual compass. And if something doesn't happen, their lives are going to be made shipwrecked before they get a chance to, to live them. And God says, every one of them I send to you is a leader of thousands. Glory they're going to, to God. minister and they're going to stand in positions of leadership and touch thousands for Jesus because he says, Lisa, you're not a resource I waste. Amen. Says the Father. Amen. And I'm going to justify. I see you even looking back over the, the next 10 years and beginning to see some benchmarks in God as the Lord. You realize you're going to see God's using you and it will begin to justify things you've gone through in the past. And you'll be able to say, now that's paid for. Now that's paid for. Now Jesus got what He paid for when He walked me through that. And when He took me through that. And when my daughters went through that. Now that's paid for. Now I see the echo. Now I see the mirror of that which God promised. Thank you, Lord. And even your daughters are going to be involved. There's a true mentoring ministry uh, uh, that you're going to move in in the lives. And not just not just women, but primarily I do see it. Young women, young professionals, educated young women, women who have aspirations, women who aren't willing to say, I can't have professional success if I want to have children. And part of your message is going to be, you get to have it all. Amen. And God's going to show how Amen. to have both professional success ministry portion and the personal fulfillment of uh, of children and a home and a, and a husband Father. that they can provide that nurturing environment for. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna, I see people coming up to you saying, who are you? And how did you ever teach these women mm -hmm. to have this? How, how did you ever dream that up? And God says, it's not something that's going to proceed out of your intellect. That is coming out of your your heart, Lisa. The Lord says, um, "Longevity is your portion." Hallelujah. Uh, you and Alex, I, I see the two of you uh, in in much later years when you start getting shorter and grayer <laughs> and kind of cute. You know, you're going to be that little <laughs> couple going in the Walmart. Oh, aren't they cute? <laughs> And, and God says you're not going to be like many uh, older couples who just have a lot of isolation and they don't have people come by their house. And God says you're going to have people in your driveway knocking on your door. You're going to have young people, very young people, who are going to look at you as a treasured gift. Not only your own family, uh, grandchildren. The Lord tells me, he doesn't give me a number of grandchildren, but he does say this. There are four grandchildren. But I don't say that's all of your grandchildren. I got that very clearly. But four of them are going to move in ministry portion. And two of them will be missionaries. One will be a missionary to Western Europe. One will be a missionary to Northern Africa. And the Father says they're going to be used mightily in the two of you. And when they go... The whole time they're going, when they're out there in the mission field, they're going to be thinking, how would Nanny Lisa do, do this? How would uh, Papa Alex, how would he answer this question? How would he handle this challenge? And you see the phone ringing in, and you're picking up the phone, and you're, you're counseling them about things you've never even done. And because of the wisdom of God Thank that's you, on the inside of you, you are carriers of a glory. Hallelujah. And you're going to help many others. You will usher many others into these things. But even your own family, your own bloodline. He says, God says you've purchased that privilege by your obedience. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Glory Thank you, Father. to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We you give you glory. Okay. Go on. This brother right here. Let's get his name. Heard a lap. What's your first name? David. David, David may I prophesy to you? David Lapp. Thank you. Let's speak over here. Okay. No, you can be there. But that's coming out. And this is your spouse in the back. And yes. her name is? Fanny. 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 David and Fanny. The Lord told me you have an entrepreneurial calling upon your life. I don't know what you do for a living. 
I don't know if you've ever seen yourself as a businessman or seen yourself involved in any kind of a business, as opposed to one who, you know, works for an hourly wage, has a W-2, you're somebody who is filing uh, as a, someone who is self-employed and you have an entrepreneurial gifting upon your life, and it's similar to what Paul encountered whenever he realized that schools in Paul's time were uh, commercial concerns. And when he got tired of getting stoned, beat up, uh, left for dead, whenever he kept going into the synagogue and getting, and getting persecuted, he went to Ephesus and the angel of God appeared to him and said, Fear not, Paul, I will not let someone, anyone set on thee to hurt thee. You will be here and you will uh, bring the gospel into this area. And the very next thing is he hooked up with a guy by the name of Tyrannus and he had meetings in this man's school for two years and the most powerful church of the New Testament era was born, the church of the Ephesians, out of which John later came who ultimately wrote the Revelation. The Father says, out of your life, in a commercial venue, in an entrepreneurial venue activity, I am going to send beat up, scuffed up, persecuted, even some that have been physically wounded, men and women of God, who are going to seek you out and find a place of safe harbor in just simply the environment that's going to orbit around you. God says, everything I'm doing in your life in the area of finances, how you make your living, uh, your bank balance, the, the, the properties and the things that are part of your life. The ministry purpose behind it, says the Father, is to create a safe environment for those that have been persecuted, those that have been hounded, those that are burnt out, those that are fleeing. They're just tired of it because remember what the angel told, told Paul, I fear not, Paul. It's one of the most poignant scriptures in the book of Acts. Fear not, I will not let anybody harm you and they'll know when they get around you, they'll have an innate understanding of just a sense of safety and the freedom to be who God called them to be. And, and part of it, at times, you're going to feel like your life is like a Holy Ghost hospital. They'll come all beat up, banged up, bruised, and battered. And then about the time they get it all together, you know, you can hug and say, okay, we'll see you later, David, and we'll see you on the backside. And uh, but God says, it's ministry portion says the Father. And I'm going to create an environment of wholesomeness, productivity, and David, even profitability that's going to be about accommodating that. And with everyone that I send to you, there's going to be a yoking up. We're going, you're going to know what... You're going to know the pull of the yoke upon apostolic workers who are doing true apostolic work, not just going around like engineers They got the name apostle, but not the ministry apostles. And David he says, you're one of the ones that I talked about earlier tonight. He that worketh miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or the hearing of faith? There's going to come a day David, that your question will not be, God, are you going to resurrect this person? Mm. Or God, is this how I'm supposed to be praying? Because you're actually going to have an experience of bringing somebody back who's going to have a real hard time with you because you did <laughs> I mean, Why did you do that? Because the Father says, I put a resolute faith on the inside of you that there's this place in you that I'm going to give you access to that says I'm not taking no for an answer. Mm. Yes. It, you're one of those people, like you hear the stories about Smith Wigglesworth, and he made statements that if he hadn't moved in miracles, he wouldn't have accepted them saying it. He said, if the Spirit doesn't move, I'll move the Spirit. You're one of those there's old joke we used to tell about the Snake Handling Church where I grew up. And uh, this... Uh, couple was there, this singing group was on the stage, and they didn't know it was a snake handling church. And they told a joke in a personal prophecy, the first time ever. And, uh, and so they're, they're singing, and all of a sudden they see the rattlesnakes coming out. And one of the, the performers leans over to the other guy, and he, 
He says, uh, "Where's uh, where do you think the back door is? He said, I already looked and there isn't one. He said, well, reckon where do they want one? <laughs> and that's the joke that God told me to say this to you. You're one of those people that you're not going to take blank walls for an answer. Amen. <laughs> you're one of these people when you see a blank wall, your first thought is, reckon where do they want a door? <laughs> You're not going to be one of these passive Woo! brothers that says, Well, God opens the door and closes the door. No, the Father says, Remember he said Amen. the imitator of God is dear children? That's what he said. In Ephesians. Mm -hmm. And we know that Jesus is the door. If we're supposed to imitate him, he's the door. You're a door. And God said, it's like he told me when he went to the disciples when they were cowering after his crucifixion and he appeared to them behind the closed doors. He said, he said, I really didn't walk through the wall. I just walked through a door that no one else could see. God says, I'm going to bring you to a cowering people with apostolic calling upon their life. And they're cowering behind walls and they don't know how to get past the impediments that are keeping them from their calling. Mm. And you're going to appear. You're going to manifest himself Amen. to them. And suddenly all the things that have been holding them back, they don't know what they've been waiting for. And they're going to get up and charge hell with a water pistol full of gasoline <laughs> and say, David encouraged him to do it. Because Amen. it's your calling, David. Glory it's to God. It's a call of God. Upon Praise you, Jesus. Amen. So be it. So be it. If you hear something in a prophecy and you want it, you can have it. Because God is not a respecter of persons. He's a respecter of faith. And if you can believe it, as we prayed earlier, you can have it. Glory. This little lady here in the green jacket. Your name again? Lori Agnes. This is Lori Agnes' word. Lori, if you study the life of Deborah, who was a prophet in the Bible in the Old Testament, her name means a bee. A bee. That's why Peter said, desire the sincere milk of the word, and that's talking about the scripture. But the prophetic word is like honey. Too much honey makes you vomit. That's why the Bible says despise not prophesy. See, but how many get tired of hearing prophecies? I remember being too, I'm tired of everybody telling me in prophecy what a tremendous ministry I'm going to have that I'm going to go around the world and I'm going to preach the gospel. I got tired of hearing it because too much honey, too many prophetic words make you vomit. You have projectile rejection of what God is saying. But the Lord says, you are a beekeeper in the Spirit. Amen. You are a beekeeper. He said, you are a prophetic archivist. That you're one that I'm going to begin to cause you to define and to identify the prophetic word that has been spoken over your region and over your area. Not just the general word that's going out into the earth, although there will be parts of that, but specifically, even prophetic words. I'm going to bring... Three prophetic words to you that have been spoken in years past. Some of them all the way back in the 60s, in the 50s. Prophetic words that were given, that have been ignored, that have been passed over. And they're beginning to come to pass. And I'm going to expose you as a, as a Holy Ghost spiritual beekeeper of the prophetic word. I'm going to show you prophets where others don't see prophets. I'm going to show you prophetic words. Even I see you picking up a newspaper or watching the headlines on the news and something you see suddenly becomes prophetic to you and you're just jotting it down and you're going to begin to put together the pieces of things that I'm doing, says the Father, because I, I'm, I'm going to use you to commission the building of a net that is prepared to bring in a net-breaking catch, says the Father. Glory to God. Glory to God. Are you married? The Lord tells me that your husband is a builder. I don't know what he does for a living. Does he work with his hands? At times. At times. The Lord says, I made this man to be a builder. He is someone who can put together useless things and cause them to find their purpose, to even to repurpose and to re task and I put that on the inside of him and part of that has made him at times like a little bit disgruntled you know a little bit you know, because he's one of these people he, he wants to see he, he doesn't have much 
struck with useful uselessness. <laughs> and even in his own self at times felt useless. And because he felt useless, he kind of consigned that, kind of wrote off some things that the Father says, I'm going to start writing back into his life because I put value in that man, Glory says the Father. God. And that value that I have written in him, I am activating in this hour. I am activating in this season. I'm going to speak to him in the night times. I'm going to come and he's going to have visitation. He's going to wake up and know that there's somebody besides you and the dog or whatever in the room. And God says, I'm going to begin to speak to him and make myself known to him in ways that are unimpeachable and that are going to begin to change him, which doesn't mean he's going to get along any better with certain people he hadn't been able to get along with in the past because he doesn't have much tolerance for pretense. He's, you know, P.T. Barnum would not be his favorite person. He doesn't like about the real estate. We talk about puffing. You know, you take a shack and turn it into a mansion. He hates exaggeration. Wow. But God says, I'm going to show him the genuine. I'm going to clear the smoke and mirrors of the enemy that's tried to rob him of his portion. God says, that man's destiny will not be an abortion. Glory God to says, God. the two of you are called. To be a power couple in the kingdom. Hallelujah, Jesus. Unique, unique purpose, says the Father, on your life and the life of your husband. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Father. This couple right here. A fellow like me, he's got more beach than waves. He's got a better beard than I do. Yes. <laughs> Mike. Michael. Mike and... And are you are you two yeah. husband and wife? Yes. Okay. Can you stand? Michael and, and who? Antoinette. Thank this you. Is for Michael and Antoinette. The Lord told me something really simple for the two of you. He said, "I am salting you for a new season." He said, "I said of my people, they are the salt of the earth." And if the salt has lost its savor, the enemy has worked really, really hard in your lives to cause you to be salt that has lost its savor. But the Lord says, it's a new day. It's a new day for you, Michael. It's a new day for you, Antoinette. The Lord says, my, my, my moniker over you, my motto over you is, I am salting you for a new season. The enemy's tried to lock you in. The enemy's tried to rob you. I even see false accusation. I'm about to expose false accusation that has come uh, against you and you Jesus. haven't known uh, quite at times how to fight that when people start looking at you and dealing with you in ways that God doesn't look at you and God doesn't deal with you. But I'm going to begin to show you, says the Father, how to stand up in the robust reality of your anointing yes, and who I I have, who I say you are is going to trump who they say you are. What I say you can do is going to plow under what they say you cannot do, says the Father. Come on now. And I'm going to raise you up into a place of upgrade, promotion on an accelerated scale, says the Father. Get ready, get ready, get ready, says the Lord. And even in, in one particular situation where it seems like you gotta gotta write that off, that write that one off to experience. I see repentance coming. I see a a vicious lie being uh, turned under, being plowed under by someone who's going to be so moved upon by the Holy Ghost, it will come and say, I repent. They'll use those words. I repent. They're not going to come and say, well, we were both wrong. Or I, I might have been wrong about that. No, it's going to be full-blown, 100% complete, total repentance. Even by their physical stature, how they... Hey, body language. I, I even see this person getting on their knees Jesus. in front of you because of the conviction Jesus. of the Holy Ghost that says you will not be denied in this season. Says the Lord. Thank you. God bless you. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Glorify your name, Lord. Angela DeShazo. This is for Angela DeShazo. Thank you, Father, for Angela. 
Mm -hmm. It's okay. You're allowed. You're allowed. Thank you, Jesus. You may approach the bench. Thank you. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> I heard the father say about you, Angela. The father said, it's like he's having a conversation with you. He says, Angela, we are not going to take no for an answer. He said, I want you to begin to populate your yes column. Mm -hmm. So it's like a column of challenges. The Bible says, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. He said, I want you to begin to populate your yes column. Yes to the salvation of your loved ones. Yes to ministry portion. Yes, even to areas of your life where you say, well, God, I don't know if it's very spiritual of me to want this to be different. Shouldn't I just be happy with the way things are? And the Lord says, I'm not asking, I don't settle. The Lord says, I don't settle. I don't compromise. I get to have it all, says the Father. And because I get to have it all, the Lord says, you get to have it all because I can trust you. Yes. I can trust you because you've trusted me. And the Lord says, hey, start populating your yes column. Yes to salvation of loved ones. Yes, even to just creature comforts and what your life looks like in a, in a natural way. Yes. Because the Father says, I don't, I don't accept disappointment and I'm not asking you to accept disappointment. I don't want you to begin to itemize those things because He says that my plan for you is so ostentatious and so beyond what man would be willing to give you, says the Father, that if you were to evaluate it by the eyes of man, it would seem like fantasy. Uh, people with a religious mentality would say, that just ain't right. But the Lord says, I'm not asking their permission because I have bequeathed upon you by the shed blood of Jesus the entitlement of one whose prayers are answered, the entitlement of one who experiences everything you say and do as effective as if God said it or did it. And you're going to walk many. You have an evangelism. You have a spirit of evangelism upon you, says the Father. You're going to lead many, many souls to Christ. A spirit of prophetic evangelism to demonstrate the power of God, to demonstrate the Spirit of God in a supernatural way, says the Father. And that mantle comes upon you even tonight. Even tonight, before you go to bed tonight, Father God, it's going to manifest in your life, says the Lord. Praise God. We thank you for it, Father. Thank you, We say Jesus. yes, Lord. Yes. Thank yes, you, Lord. Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Yep. No. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. This lady back here behind the gentleman in the yellow shirt. Yes, you. What is your name? Danielle. Thank you, Father. Danielle, in the scriptures, there are many references to God birthing something. Zion hath travailed and brought forth children. God says there's a real spirit of birthing things. You know, intercessors, people that pray, and, and I don't know what you know about intercession, but people that pray in intercession, they talk about birthing something in prayer. They talk about praying something through where you go with a burden of of praying for a particular thing until you just get a release on the inside of you and they compare it to a birth. And God says, I'm sending lost causes to you. You are someone that will pray and believe God for people and for circumstances and situations that nobody else will even trouble themselves with. And I'm going to send lost cause people to you. And I even see you at times taking uh, these people into your life in a very intimate way in order that you can just get your hands on them and get, your, get their countenance, in, in, like right here into your countenance to begin to speak into their lives. And when you begin to look at them, it just looks like death. It looks like emptiness, hopelessness, no joy, no expectation of things being any better. And you're like this battering ram of joy, this battering ram of hope. They say, you don't understand. Things can be different. You don't understand. Things will be different. And I, I see you provoke it. Say it with me. And, and you're almost shaking them, you know, like <laughs> rattling them until their teeth chatter. And say, I'm not going to let you be destroyed because the enemy, in, in your lifetime, the enemy's tried to plow you under. He's tried 
to rob you of the good things of God and the Lord says we've changed that. You've had the sense even before like a plant that hasn't broken ground yet that you know that there's been something conceived on the inside of you and that life is going to be different for you. And even as it begins to happen, God says you're going to package it up and partition that benefit, blessing, and breakthrough out to others in a radical, supernatural way. God says pay attention to the direction that you put your focus because I'll see to it that you will be where your attention takes you. He says get it from the Holy Ghost. It's not a question of God opens uh, one door and he closes another. God says, I'll put ten doors in front of you and you're going to have to hear from me which one to step through. <laughs> and you're going to be a facilitator. You're going to be one that will accommodate breakthrough, shift, and change for many. You, sister, have a breaker anointing Hallelujah. in your life yeah. to break poverty, to break hopelessness, Hallelujah. to break yeah. emptiness and loneliness off of the lives of others. And will I uh, use you to impart such to others and not bring it in full manifestation even into your own life? I will recompense you. He said, I'm going to settle some accounts. I'm going to correct some things out of your past life. It's like long-standing, almost like an, uh, an issue of angst. Like that never got fixed. This was unjust. It should have been different. And God says, I'm going to begin to upend and to upright some things, even in your past life, that you, you're not bitter, but you could have been. Hmm. You, you're one of these people, you could have gone through some experiences, you could have had a bitter root judgment, but you chose not to. And part of it's just your pragmatism. You don't necessarily see yourself as the most tender, emotional person you can imagine. <laughs> but God says, you did make a choice not to get better. And because you chose not to get better, I'm going to see to it that even that gets better. Even something that just seems like you've written it off as that was then, that's past, shut the door on that chapter. God says, it's good that you were willing to go on, but I never walk away from a fight. And I'm going to redeem even some lost, seemingly lost ground in your life, says the Father, because that's who I am. And that's what I do. Glory to God. Um, Carol, what's the gal's name next to you? Barbara. Barbara. Is she related? My sister. Okay. Uh, Barbara, have you ever heard of a twin anointing? There are people that carry a twin anointing and they, they can pray for women to have twins. Um, the Lord said that word that that girl just got is yours. There's a twin anointing because you are relating and pulling on the Holy Ghost for every single word out of Russ's mouth was for you and you knew it. And so it's yours too, Barbara. You get to have it all. You get to have it all. Amen. Okay, you want to start and I'll follow up? Uh, it's a couple. Okay. The couple, uh, so you have a yellow shirt and the lady in the pink. Could you stand please? And remind us of your names. Uh, Leroy Stanton. Leroy? Leroy. And? Sally And Sally. God bless you. Thank you for coming tonight. I just see the hand of the Lord has been steady and strong on you for many, many years. And you, you think you might have missed out on some things, but the reason you're here tonight is because the Father specifically wanted you to know your breakthrough has come. That you've been carriers of glory, you've been carriers of dreams, you've been one that has carried big visions and big dreams. And, and I see you sitting on your couch and you're holding your cups of coffee and you're saying, you know, if, we, if money was no object, we would do this, 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 and this. And the Father said, because you've made me your object and money is not your object, I'm going to give you everything you asked for. I'm going to give that to you in abundant supply because I'm going to cause you to be a distribution center for many of the things that I'm going to do in the earth. You're going to know, you have the wisdom of years, life experience to know how to hand it out, how to pass it out, and you're not going to ruin anybody by giving them the goods of God. So I hear the Father say, thank you for holding steady. Thank you for not turning back. Thank you for not going the other way. When you might have been weary and well-doing, you didn't stop, you didn't faint. And the Father said, I'm about to bless you in a really big way. Amen. We have one more.